It's with thanksgiving in my heart I will enter its doors with praise. I will say this is the day that the Lord has made. I will rejoice for He has made me glad. He has made me glad. He has made me glad. I will rejoice for He has made me glad. He has made me glad. He has made me glad. Good to see so many out. We've had some people who uh, have not been feeling well who were out or uh, who decided to uh, be somewhere else for a couple weeks or whatever. So we're, we're glad that you're all are here. If you're visiting with us, please fill out one of the visitor's cards and give it to somebody or put it at the end of the seat and we'll pick it up after uh, services this morning. Not too many announcements. Um, there are some cards to sign in the back. So please sign those before you leave. Uh, Brenda is home. She's wearing herself out, and now she can't talk. And um, <laughs> she's not feeling good. She's got a she's, she's got a, a, a bad bad cough and sore throat, and she's not getting a lot of sleep. She wakes up at three o'clock in the morning, worries about everything, and, and uh, she's you know she's trying to make herself better. Uh, she's got a a little party planned tomorrow for her mom and dad's 71st anniversary over at the nursing home, and she's hoping she can come out for that. So, if not, it probably won't happen. It's a lunch yeah. But uh, there are a couple of other things we want to go over. Um, I wanted to mention, even though it's in the bulletin, uh, Jacob's wife, Carol, uh, her parents aren't doing real well, and uh, she is not uh, herself handling it great either. And so we need to remember to pray for her and help her out as much as we can. And there's uh, some information in here uh, about all of that. So please, let's, you know, let's rally around her and, and, and help her through this. Uh, she's going through the, the issues that are helping her and hindering her uh, parents. The uh, cans, the Silver for Children can, leader cans, um, they will be uh, returned to them Sunday, April 10th. So we've got a little bit of time left. If you have one of those, please fill it up. If you don't, there's still some on the table in the back. Also, the commodities that they'll pick up uh, that same week, are, there's a list of things in there that they need uh, from us also. <coughs> please look that over and um, you know, let's, let's fill them up like we usually do. You know, the guys usually impress when he comes here and there's just so much stuff you can hardly get it in the van. So let's do that again, help, uh, help them out. Ladies Outreach Group, March 1st is uh, coming up and there's a bulletin uh, article about that in there as well if you weren't uh, involved with the ladies outreach please do so uh, if you're a lady first of all you're a man you know, you'll, they'll talk about you if you show up so you know that so uh anyway other things in there got a card it just says a blessing you it says thank you my brothers and sisters a big thank you for all your expressions of love and prayers with cards, texts, emails, and phone calls during my recovery from my fight with the ice. <laughs> recovery is slow but progressive. God is good all the time. So glad he's back again this morning. Uh, he, he's a hard one to keep down, according to what Barb says. So we gotta sit on him a little bit and make, make sure he doesn't uh, make, help him up and down the steps. We don't want that happening again. And so. Uh, it's good to have him, have him back uh, with us here lately. So, ready? <clears throat> praise the Lord. Sing to the Lord a new song. Sing his praises in the assembly of the faithful. 
church family, pray blessing upon the programs, back and memories of work, those things that will spread into the community. We pray, Lord, that <coughs> these programs started, that we would continue them under your Thank you now, Lord, we praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. <coughs> Turn our lines for the uh, Lord's Supper. Whenever two or three of you are coming together in my name, I am there with you. Yeah. 
son and daughter do the same care to the raging parents. Remember that, Eric. <laughs> uh, Webster's definition of labor of love is a labor voluntarily undertaken or performed without consideration of any benefit or reward. This describes He didn't have to die on the cross for us. God didn't have to. So, send him down without a labor of love. So we could be saved. Let's remember that as we ask for the blessing. Dear God, we pray that you bless the bread. It represents Son and our Savior's body. We pray that we analyze ourselves in a way that we take this as pleasing to you, Lord. Thank you for all the blessings you have given us, most of all for Jesus. It's in his blessing name we pray. Through the vine, represents your son's blood. If it wasn't for Jesus, we would have no hope for it. We thank you for that. Thank you for everything you've given us all the blessings. We must fall for Jesus. It's in his blessing we pray. money that we donate helps carry on his work so we can lead others to Christ. Dear God, thank you for giving us this opportunity to give back a portion of the blessing that you've given us. We pray that we um, put these funds in place will benefit your kingdom in the best way. Thank you for everything. 
Oh, sweet Jesus. Send his best in you, pray. You're involved with the children's class. You may be dismissed at this time. scripture reading this morning comes from the Gospel of Luke, chapter 5, verses 1 through 11. On one occasion, while the crowd was pressing in on him to hear the word of God, he was standing by the lake of Gennesaret. And he saw two boats by the lake, but the fishermen had gone out of them and were washing their nets. Getting into one of the boats, which was Simon's, he asked him to put out a little from the land, and he sat down and taught the people from the boat. And when he had finished speaking, he said to Simon, Put out into the deep and let down your nets for a catch. And Simon answered, Master, we toiled all night and took nothing, but at your word I will let down the nets. And when they had done this, they enclosed a large number of fish, and their nets were breaking. They signaled to their partners in the other boat to come and help them, and they came and filled both the boats so that they began to sink. But when Simon Peter saw it, he fell down at Jesus' knees, saying, Depart from me, for I am a sinful man, O Lord. For he and all who were with him were astonished at the catch of fish that they had taken. 
And so also were James and John, sons of Zebedee, who were partners with Simon. And Jesus said to Simon, do not be afraid. From now on, you will be catching men. But when they had brought their boats to land, they left everything and followed him. Please be seated. Well, good morning once again. It's a, it's a beautiful sunny Lord's Day has been mentioned already. And I am so glad that you chose to come and be here with us this morning. Members and guests alike, we are so, so glad that you are here. And uh, we hope that you are benefited from the words that we are going to hear from God's Word this morning. God's Word is sharper than any two-edged sword. It, it cuts and it, it does its work. We need to make sure that we're, we're ready for that. We're going to hear some things today that might stick us a little bit, might step on our toes, full disclosure. And we also have quite a bit of ground to cover, a whole 14 verses. So dig in, get comfy, make sure you've got your ears on, your eyes in the text, and let's look at all of this together. We're in John chapter 21. We're working through verses 1 through 14 this morning. And so if you have your Bibles, and I hope you do, I would invite you to open up there. John 21. Verses 1 through 14. Now I'm sad to say we only have two more sermons in this wonderful book. It has been such a blessing to me in my study of it. And I hope you've been blessed by the, the fruit of that labor. They knew it was the Lord. That is the, that is the assessment that the disciples had at the end of this event. And we need to make sure that we have that same assessment. When we look at this, we determine that we are in fact looking at the Lord, the Son of God. We've just looked at recently what, what really would have been a great stopping point in the Gospel of John, in my opinion. If you go back maybe a page in your Bible to verses 30 through 31. Now Jesus did many other signs in the presence of the disciples which are not written in this book. But these are written so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God. And that by believing, you may have life and that is eternal life in his name. To me that sounds like a great point to stop. But the Holy Spirit says otherwise. More things were penned, more things for us to learn about who Jesus was, more things to instill belief in us, more things that glorify Jesus as the Lord, the Christ, the Son of God. And so we want to look at those things because you know, it looks like a good place to stop there. There's more that we need to know. And so when we get into our text this morning, in John 21, we come to a familiar scene. This is one scene that we've seen over and over again where Jesus is with the disciples at the Sea of Galilee. And initially they didn't realize it was Jesus. They didn't know that it was him on the shore. But one of the first problems that we encounter in our text is that rather than just waiting for him there as they were instructed to do, what did they do? They, they defaulted to their old way of life. They went fishing. Now, Jesus had told them to go there after appearing to them in Matthew chapter 28, verses 7 and 10. He, he said, go to the Sea of Galilee and wait for me there. Simple instructions. Go there and wait. And again, the problem is, is rather than waiting, they just went back to their old way. And so in our text today, we're going to see a recurring lesson. It's a lesson we all know, but one that we need to be reminded about constantly because we tend to default to our old ways and that is the importance of doing things God's way. We must do things God's way. And then to look for the blessings that follow from doing things God's way. That's what I hope to accomplish this morning. So I hope the things we discuss will encourage us as we consider our own personal evangelistic efforts. That has been the theme for the last year and a half, almost two years now. We want to be evangelistic. We want to be able to reach out into the community and make an impact for Christ. And so I hope these things will give us comfort in knowing that the, the burden of success doesn't lie squarely on our shoulders. It's a big job when we look at this world and it's, it's lostness. And it can be quite a burden to think that all of the, the weight and the responsibility is squarely on us. We have responsibility. Make no mistake, mistake about it. We are responsible to do the work. But the success of that work doesn't lie solely on us. Secondly, I hope it gives us confidence in knowing that God does, in fact, work with us and through us to that end. 
We have the best help somebody could ever have for the greatest job that has ever been given. And we should have confidence in that. And lastly, I hope in the things that we study this morning that we will have contentment in the fruit of our labor because we know that God's hands were in it. God produced it. And he used us in making it. I hope we can find supreme contentment in that. So let's go ahead and look at some of these things. But I just lied. I'm sorry. i got to come forward. A couple more things to introduce with. I hope that in light of all of this, that we pursue the tremendous blessing that is a part of working with the Lord. Just stop and consider that fact for a moment. You get to work with the, the supreme sovereign Lord of all creation. And he's willing to work with you. That's a marvelous thought. It's more than a thought. It's a reality. And as we now get into this passage, we're going to look at the last sign miracle that Jesus performs in this book. Now, John records all these miracles as being signs. And what a, a sign miracle is, is, is a miracle with a message. It's not just doing something supernatural for that sake, but it's doing something supernatural to communicate the truth about Jesus that he wants his disciples that's us as well, to understand about him. It is a miracle with a message. And so the sign we're going to look at illustrates the truth about Jesus. And so we want to answer the question, what is the truth that we are to learn from this sign? And there's actually several truths that we need to learn from this sign. And the first one is this. Human inability. Human inability. Powerlessness. In other words, look at verses 1 through 5 with me. After these, this, Jesus revealed himself again to the disciples by the Sea of Tiberias, which is also Galilee. And he revealed himself in this way. Simon Peter, Thomas, called the twin, Nathaniel of Cana in Galilee, the sons of Zebedee, and two others of his disciples were together. And Simon Peter said to them, I'm going fishing. And they said to him, we will go with you. Now, ordinarily, that sounds like a great guy's trip out on the lake, but that wasn't what Jesus told them to do. They went out, got into the boat, but they, that night they caught nothing. Just as day was breaking, Jesus stood on the shore, yet the disciples did not know that it was Jesus. And Jesus said to them, Children, this isn't a, a term of endearment he's using here. Children, you have any fish? They answered him, no. You ever had that, that talk you have a boy go out fishing? You have any fish? Any luck? No. The other disappointment? Human inability is the first lesson we need to look at here. Now, one of the first things I want to make mention of, just in passing really, is the influence that Peter had on the rest of the group. Now, they were told to just sit there by the lake and wait for Jesus, but Peter influenced the group to go out fishing instead, rather than waiting on the Lord. So the, the message, at least in passing here, is be careful who you let influence. Peter was a good guy. Uh, he was very headstrong. He was very gung-ho. He had a, a, a pretty good heart about things. But he was wrong, and he still influenced the rest of the group to go in the wrong direction. We need to make sure that our strongest influences are in our life are people who are on mission for Jesus. Whose heads are, are where Jesus' head would be at, doing what Jesus would have them to do. We need to make sure that we associate most closely with those kind of people. How easily does the world influence us? So easily. You turn on the news, you hear some guy gabbing about something unchristian, un unbiblical, and you start to think, yeah, that sounds pretty good. But it's not necessarily what Jesus would say. We need, we need to be, be mindful about who our influences are. We look a little bit close, more closely at these men, and as we've made mention before, these were essentially professional fishermen. They knew what they were doing. They had done this many times before, and yet together, they were unsuccessful. They didn't catch anything. Not even a single fish. You'd think these guys who had done this for a living would be able to catch something. And yet they caught nothing. Not a single fish. And so the question that comes to my mind is, why is that? 
And how does that relate to what Jesus is going to be teaching here in just a moment with this son? Because under normal circumstances, I would imagine they would have been successful and caught fish and things would have been great. But again, Jesus is using this instance to teach a lesson. And so I believe wholeheartedly that God prevented them from having any form of success in what they were trying to do. This is human inability. And the point is made by their inability to catch any fish. And so through this, their inability to catch fish, Jesus is teaching them that they cannot, and they should not, and they must not rely and trust on themselves for success. Success is not found in ourselves. Remember what Jesus said about three months ago in John 15? I'm the vine, you're the branches. Unless you abide in me, what? You, you can bear fruit. Apart from me, you can do nothing. And in the context there, he's talking about spiritual fruit, fruit of ministry in essence. Apart from me, you can do nothing. I believe that very same lesson is being reiterated here in this sign. Apart from me, you can do nothing. When it comes to bearing spiritual fruit or catching fish, as it were, we cannot bear it. We cannot catch it without the Lord. We cannot trust in ourselves to make it come about. Now, why do I say this? Why is this important? How does it pertain to us? I say it because no matter what ministries we are engaged in, whatever programs that we initialize, whatever we come up with to try and evangelize to this community, if we are not abiding in the Lord, if the Lord is not integral in it, if it is not built upon Him, His mission, His method, and all of that, we are guaranteed to be unsuccessful. We cannot rely on our own ingenuity, our own thinkings. It must be fully on the Lord. And oh, by the way, this ministry that we talk so often about extends well beyond the borders of this building. We know that, right? But let's be a little bit more specific. Our ministry extends into our families. We have a spouse, we have a kids, whatever the case may be, and we want them to be fruitful in the Lord. Well, guess what, church? It's not going to happen unless we abide in Christ ourselves. It's not going to happen. We will be unsuccessful. The same goes for our work. What kind of influence do you want to have for the Lord at work? You're around people all day. You want, to, you want to see them come to Christ, ideally, right? Well, unless we personally abide in the Lord, we can guarantee that's not going to happen. That's not to say that they will, but we can say for sure it won't if we do not abide in the Lord. If we don't do things His way. So Jesus is on the shore. If we get back to our text here. Jesus is on the shore. He points out the obvious. You guys didn't catch anything, didn't you? They needed to hear it. They needed to hear that they were unsuccessful from an outside source, and they needed to acknowledge it. Yeah, we, we didn't have any success in our endeavor. Things did not pan out. We, we didn't have success in what we put out to do. He says, in essence, you kids have nothing to eat. You got nothing. They lack, acknowledged their lack of success. They said no. They understood that lack of success. But then things very quickly turn around for them. So we make our way on to verse 6. And verse 6 really highlights the importance for us to, to do things God's way and God's way only. Look at verse 6 with me. He said to them, cast your nets on the right side of the boat and you will find some. So they cast it. What does Jesus mean by some? So they cast it and now they were not able to haul it in. Because of the quantity of fish. So, they did what Jesus said and caught many large fish. You look a little bit farther down in the text, you'll see 153 large fish. This was an utter success. This was beyond what they had expected, this was beyond what they could handle. They were utterly successful. So, what is the difference? There's only one difference. I mean, look at this. They're in the same lake. They're in the same area. They haven't really drifted off anyway. They're using the same nets. They're using the same 
casting motion, to throw the nuts out there, everything is the same. What is the difference? Well, the difference is Jesus told them to do it that way. It was exactly as Jesus intended them to do, and that and that alone made them successful. God's way is not only the right way, it is the only way to be successful, and just as a side note, it is the only way that honors God. Because if God says, this is the way it is to be done, this is the way that gives success in what you're trying to do, and we say to God, you know what, that's pretty good, I like that, but what if we did it this way? I'm not comfortable with your way, God. I'm not comfortable with doing it that way. I don't, I don't like doing it that way. So what if I change it this direction? I change it this way because I'm more comfortable doing that. What does that say to God? That's an essence saying, no thanks. I don't like what you have to say. I don't like your directions. I'm doing my own way. What is that? That's pride. That's rebellion. And it certainly doesn't honor God. We do think God's do things God's way. It is the only way that honors God. We need to make sure that we are mindful of that. And so all things done for ministry, for God's kingdom and its growth must be done in God's way and God's way alone. Now, we might think that's very restrictive. We might have some issues with that. But consider this as well. God has blessed us God has blessed us in filling us in on what his way is. He's given us the blueprint and the instructions in the book to, to know what it is, to glean that information and then apply it. He hasn't left us in the dark. He hasn't left us to our own devices to just figure it out. He's, he's spelled it out for us. It's quite a blessing, quite a benefit for us when you stop and think about it. It's not to be restrictive. It's to bless us and to guarantee our success. So all that we do as Christians, all that we do as Christ church, must be in keeping with God's way. And so the question we have to ask ourselves as we consider all of that is, am I willing to reject my own way, my own preferences, and submit myself to doing my life, to doing ministry, to doing all that I do under God's instruction, to doing it God's way? And I think we should. I know we should. And that's really what we need to do because... If we look a little bit further in our text, we're going to see that when we do things God's way, God gives the increase. God gives the increase. He guarantees it. He brings about the increase. We love that Paul planted, Apollos watered, but God gives the increase. We talk about that all the time. Well, we're going to see that very fact playing out in our text here in just a moment. Beginning in verse 6, we'll, we'll read that again. He said to them, Cast the net on the right side of the boat, and you will find some. So they cast it, and now they were not able to haul it in because of the quantity of fish. That disciple whom Jesus loved therefore said to Peter, It is the Lord. When Simon Peter heard that it was the Lord, he put on his outer garment, for he was strict for work, and he threw himself in the sea. If we were only like Peter, we wanted so desperately to be with the Lord. And the other disciples came in the boat, dragging the net full of fish. For they were not far from land, but about a hundred yards off. <coughs> so we look at this. Now when, when they cast out the nets, when they obeyed the word of the Lord, instantly we have 153 large fish just driven into these nets. Just driven into the nets. They, they didn't have to sit and lure them in. Here, fishy, fishy. And then they didn't have to throw on their favorite little swimmer tail bait or nothing like that. They, they didn't have to bait them in. They didn't have to chum the waters. They didn't have to put on some kind of a show or a concert. You know what I mean? To draw these people in. They didn't have to be, be relevant with the fish to bring the fish into the net. But Jesus directed their path. Jesus knew they would be there. He orchestrated the, the lives of those fish to come into contact with that net to be brought in for catch. Now, the focus isn't on how fast these fish were caught. Rather, the focus needs to be on who brought the fish to the nets in the first place. By what power, by what authority were these fish caught? Well, Jesus' hand, no matter how you slice it, Jesus was intimately involved in their success. He brought this about their success. 
They did things Jesus' way, and Jesus provided the catch. When we obey God's way, God provides. God orchestrates lives to bring people into the kingdom. We need to stop and consider that for a moment. We probably don't think about that all, all that much, how involved God really is in, in bringing people into the kingdom. Consider your own life. That's really the best place to start. Consider your own life and what things God did in your life throughout your whole existence to prepare you to come into the kingdom and ultimately get you there. When all of the glory and all of the honor is his. Now, the first thing we need to know is first, someone, someone was doing things God's way. Somebody was doing things God's way. That was a person who was on mission with the gospel. Doing things God's way. Next, your life was such that your heart, your mind, and your soul was prepared to receive that message from that person who was doing things God's way. And God brought you through his providential hand to that person. And together, you heard the gospel. He, pro he or she proclaimed the gospel to you that day. You heard it. You believed it, you received that gospel, and when you responded to that gospel, you were caught. You were caught, just like a fish. You were caught that day. And now that you're caught, what is your job? Now you're ready to go out there and catch some more. For everybody who is a, a faithful follower of Christ here this morning, that is your story in one way, shape, or form. Somebody was doing things God's way with his gospel on his mission, and you were caught. And now it is your job to do the same. Now Jesus uses us to catch more and bring them into the kingdom. And I think it's important here that we note this, and this is a very important fact. Uncaught fish cannot cast nets. Uncaught fish cannot cast nets. What do I mean by that? You have to be truly converted. You yourself have to be truly caught into the kingdom. You have to be truly invested in that work of the kingdom. Somebody who is truly invested in being mission-oriented, being aligned and, and in line with the mission of God. Unless you are, what kind of success are you going to have catching others? It just doesn't work. Uncaught fish cannot cast nets. Make sure you yourself are truly caught into the kingdom this morning. Jesus has already done so much that's been illustrated by this, this sign, but he does more still. And, and I want us to see this next lesson, and that is that Jesus, he preserves his catch. He preserves his catch. Look at verses 9 through 11. There's a little bit of a detail here I, I want to highlight. When they got out on land, they saw a charcoal fire in place with fish laid out on it and bread. And Jesus said to them, bring some of the fish which you have just caught. So Simon Peter went aboard and hauled the net ashore full of large fish, 153 of them. Peter was a strong guy. And although there were so many, the net was not torn. The net was not torn. Now first, we find ourselves again at a, at a charcoal fire. We've seen this fairly recently. Do you remember the last time we saw a charcoal fire? It was Peter outside the temple complex, warming his hands, just getting ready to deny his Lord three times. We're getting set up for our next lesson. Keep that in mind. What's the next thing we see? The, Jesus has prepared a meal for the disciples, and this meal looks pretty familiar too, doesn't it? We have fish and bread. Now, though that was a common meal, I, I have to wonder if it occurred to the disciples. We've seen this before. Remember that miracle of feeding the 5,000? Very familiar. Jesus then instructs them to contribute to the meal by bringing some of their fish. But remember, this fish, their catch, was produced by Jesus. We're going to see how it was preserved by Jesus and it was made plentiful by Jesus. All because of Jesus. And I, I want to focus in on this, this little phrase, the net did not tear. Why does John include that? You remember what was recorded in the Gospel of Luke when they caught the, the big sum of fish? The nets were tearing. They were breaking. Fish were escaping. <coughs> What's the point here? 
I think this detail is included for a reason. Because ordinary, under, under normal circumstances, the nets would have torn. And I believe this sign illustrates the point that the Lord preserves the catch. That is the true fruit of ministry. The, the fruit that is born out of His power is preserved. It lasts. That's not to say... It's not to say that there aren't instances where people depart from the Lord. We see that in Scripture, where people taste of the heavenly gift, they participate in all of that in Hebrews, but they end up just saying, no thanks, I don't want to have anything to do with this. But as far as Jesus is concerned, as far as the Lord is concerned, you're secure in Him. You're secure in Him. He preserves the catch. Make sure we stay caught. Stay caught. And the quantity of fish, I think this is an interesting detail. It's an eyewitness detail. 153, that's an erroneous detail unless it's from an actual eyewitness. I believe that uh, points out to the fact that this is a legitimate account. But the quantity of fish is such that teamwork was necessary to be able to bring it in. That could be a lesson all on its own. But just to stay brief, when it comes to be, being in fruitful ministry, it is a team effort. We can't stand alone. We can't do this alone. We need each other in order to be successful and bring in the catch that God can give us. <clears throat> Lost my place in my notes. So Peter finishes the task before breakfast. So I think that's important as well. They just caught all these fish. It was a great work that the Lord had done. He provided all of this fish. He's kept them secure and all of that. But Peter still had some work to do before he could sit down and have breakfast with the Lord. The fish needed to be brought in and not just left and abandoned in the boat. So when it comes to ministry, how do we apply this? When it comes to ministry, follow through is vital. It's one thing to take what the Lord brings to us. People in the nets, so, so it seems. But we can't start that work with those people and then neglect it and leave the job undone. I think it's important we make mention of that because let's just be practical. If we were in their shoes, how enjoyable or how comfortable would it be to sit down to have a, a very intimate, close, friendly fellowship meal with the Lord, knowing full well that our work was left undone? Right? How comfortable would you be sitting down with the Lord having a nice goes to conversation with him, and he says, hey, did you ever finish that? No. Didn't, did it gain round to it? I wasn't comfortable finishing that. I didn't think I had the strength to do what you told me to do. We can't leave our jobs undone, church. There is a wonderful invitation that our scripture leaves off with, and that is an invitation Jesus extends to his disciples to have intimate fellowship with him. Know what a glorious thought that is to be able to have intimate fellowship with God, the Son. It's a wonderful thought. Let's, let's go ahead and look at this a little bit more closely. Verses 12 through 14. Jesus said to them, come and have breakfast. Now none of the disciples dared to ask him, who are you? They knew it was the Lord. Jesus came and took the bread and gave it to them. So with the fish, this was now the third time that Jesus was revealed to the disciples after he was raised from the dead. Now just briefly before we get into the text, if this is a mass hallucination event, as we've talked about, this would have been the third time that everybody's had the same hallucination? I don't think so. we we'll just just throw that out there. But back to our text. Jesus graciously invites them to have breakfast with him. They hadn't done what he what they told him. They hadn't done what he told them to do. And yet we come to breakfast with the Lord. There's no scolding. There's no reprimanding for them returning to their old life or being disobedient. Instead, he blesses them. He's patient towards them. And he has taken it upon himself to personally prepare a meal for them and attend to their needs. He serves them. He serves them. Now, let's make mention of this. Jesus has attended to our greatest need already. 
our greatest need to be saved from our sins. He's already, he's already dealt with that. He's provided everything needed for us to be saved from our sins. But Jesus is a serving Savior. This is a good place to take a moment and just reflect on how utterly dependent we are upon Him. We'll look at everything we've talked about already today. He gives us the way for successful ministry. And with that, He has demonstrated it to us through His life. Going about doing good, personally interacting with people and calling them. He gives us the way of successful ministry. He orchestrates the catch. He brings people into our lives that we can have that impact on. He preserves that catch. He protects it. He provides for our needs. He serves us out of love. He deals patiently with us even when we backslide. How incredible is that? And this dependence, we need to make note of it, it never ends. We are utterly dependent on the Lord from day one, and we can never live a moment as though we aren't. We utterly depend on Him. And this is the God we serve. He is revealed in human flesh. His life and His works are recorded for us that we may believe in Him. That is, again, the point of this gospel. I hope we've made that point, and I hope that point is believed. Now, I don't believe it's coincidence that we're all here this morning. I don't believe in that. I believe God has orchestrated our lives to, to bring us about where He needs us. And I believe that we've all heard something this morning that we need to hear. God exposes us to His Word for a reason. Now, some of us, God has put on a path now to, to encounter the Gospel and truly be changed by it. Now, just hear me out for a moment. We can be people who have been exposed to that Gospel every day of our lives. We could have even obeyed the gospel, but not be changed by it. We can hear that gospel, but not be inwardly converted. We've just checked the box. And we're not truly converted to Christ. We need to make sure that, that isn't the case for us. And if it is, we need to, to repent. And we need to make sure that we remedy that situation because it's dangerous and it's bad for us. There's so much better for us. To make sure we're on the right track with that. And if that pertains to you, if you need to actually obey the gospel and become a Christian this morning, to have your sins washed away, it's Acts 2.38. Repent and be baptized for the remission of your sins. Remission of sins is found in that baptism that God has prescribed for us. Make sure our sins are washed away this morning. If you need to be baptized, immersed, we can do that for you this morning. Maybe you've walked with the Lord for a long time. Sometimes 20, 30 years. Right, Jake? Some of us have been Christians a good long time. But we've fallen into that trap of thinking that we can just do this on our own, by our own efforts and our own accord. We've lost our sense of dependency on the Lord. We have a desire to repent, hopefully. You want to recommit yourself to doing God's things, God's way. We want to support you with that endeavor. Because we know you'll be successful. We want you to be successful. And lastly, God desires, and we desire, that you have a fulfilling and intimate fellowship with Him. We can have that relationship with the Lord of all creation. Make sure you have it this morning. Commit to His work, His way, and enjoy that fellowship today. Enjoy all the blessings that come from that fellowship. And be blessed in knowing that God will use you and your redeemed life to help others to come to Him. It's a tremendous blessing. Don't pass it up and don't wait another moment. If we can serve you in any way this morning, please let us. If you'll come forward while we stand and say. Thank you. 
calling his name. Wonder, wonder, come unto me. Patiently waiting, there standing I see. Jesus, my shepherd divine. Lingering is a calling. Wolves are abroad today. Singing the sheep for straying. Seeking the lambs to slay. Jesus, a loving shepherd, call with me now to come. Enter the fold of safety, where there is rest and room. Lovingly, tenderly calling his king. Wonder, wonder, come unto me. Patiently waiting, there standing I see. Jesus, my shepherd divine. Does he bother me anymore? It's, it's there to wake you up. Appreciate David's lesson this morning. You brought some things together I had never put together, so that was that was really great. So appreciate that. One of these days we'll learn how to use a clicker in one hand and a pitch pipe in the other. Put the clicker away and put the pitch pipe. <laughs> this isn't going to do anything. Uh, appreciate everyone being out this morning. Again, appreciate the lesson. Uh, elders, deacons, preachers meeting, 4 o'clock today. Don't forget that. We have a lot to talk about. So come out for that. And then our evening worship service. So the topic was good tonight, right? Yes. Yeah. Okay. And uh, I believe it's on the glory of the Lord. So sounds like it's going to be a good one. But sometimes a topic of studies will do a lot more for you than sometimes a lesson will. Because then you get a lot of interaction and sometimes it's great stuff. So we appreciate the, all the work that puts in there. Again, I uh, appreciate everyone being here this morning. We'll close out with uh, this song and then we will have uh, a closing prayer. And have a good day. Enjoy the sunshine. <clears throat> We are the reason that he gave his life. We are the reason that he suffered in the past. Sorry. To a world that was lost, he gave all he could give to show us the reason to live. We are the reason that he gave his life. We are the reason that he suffered and died. To a world that was lost, he gave all he could give to show us the reason to live. Father, we pray that uh, the service that we've just had was uplifting for us and pleasing to you as we prepare to leave this place this morning we ask your blessings we ask for your protection for your leadership for your guidance and we pray for safety we thank you father for the message that we've heard and we thank you for the word that is for all posterity for us for those in the past and for those to come Help us, Father, find those who are looking. We pray for receptive hearts, for wise words, and for the words of God. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.